On May 10, 1940, Nazi Germany forces invaded the Netherlands, overtaking the country in five days. On bombing raids, the German Luftwaffe dropped over 97 tons of explosives on the city of Rotterdam, forcing the Dutch to surrender. During the subsequent Nazi occupation, over 100,000 Dutch Jews would be rounded up and taken to concentration camps. Few would survive. In the face of these horrors, and at the threat of losing their own liberty, an elderly father and his two daughters risk everything to save the lives of these persecuted people. This is their true story, based on the testimony of the trio's only survivor. The youngest of four children, Corrie ten Boom, was born in the Netherlands in 1892 to Casper and Cornelia, both dedicated Christians. Casper ten Boom, or Harlem's Grand Old Man as he was known, was a devoted father and husband and a man of high moral character, very much respected by the local community. This is the city of Haarlem, located in the Netherlands. It's the capital of the province of North Holland. This is also the city where Corrie ten Boom grew up. In fact, we're standing in front of her house. And it's a typical Dutch house. It's tall and narrow. The bottom floor served as a watch shop that was the family-run business. And the floors above served as living quarters. The Tambooms were a very dedicated Christian family with their values and norms firmly rooted in the Bible. Father read every day from the Bible and they had prayer. And they also uh, had varying translations of the Bible which they shared together, French, German, somebody even had a Hebrew one, I think. And the Bible was strongly a part of their life and they lived by it. The house, or beye, as they like to call the house, served them well when it was just two parents and four children. But when the elderly aunts moved in with them, they needed more space. So Father Tembom bought the house next door. But the problem was, the levels didn't match. The original house where they lived was in six, built in the 1600s. The house that uh, they purchased was built in the 1400s and it was only two stories and it faced the other way and it had a um, space between it, an alleyway, which he closed in, pulled down the two inner walls, built a spiral sort of staircase and joined the houses. And the interesting thing about that was that they're on different levels. The house of the watch shop, the Beye house, the original one, had the three floors and the other house had only two floors. So you, it, it fools me to this day because you never quite know which landing you're on and which house you're in. As you can see, the different levels made for a very odd house, a peculiarity that played an important role in the clandestine work the family would later on undertake. Corey's life was a happy one. She learned many valuable and important lessons from her father. And when Corey fell deeply in love, she fantasized about a marvelous marriage as many young women do. However, her heart was broken, her dreams shattered when the young man showed up at the house for a visit with his fiancée. Somehow Corey's social standing did not meet with his mother's expectations. So her dream was not to be. Father Tembom, as he had done even when she was a child, went up to her bedroom to comfort her. And he said, Corrie, love is the strongest force in the world. And when it is taken away, it hurts very deeply. And the important thing to do is to find another channel through which love can travel. It was as if my heart was broken that moment. And after they had gone, I went straight to my uh, bedroom. And I said, Lord Jesus, I belong to you, lock, stock, and barrel. I surrender this part of my being that is wounded. 
I have had a very happy life. And Jesus has taken care so for me that I have never become a frustrated old spinster. (laughs) But I had to surrender my if only. The decision was a definite one, and Corey never looked back, convinced that God had a greater purpose for her life. Corrie dedicated herself to the care of her aged living aunts, and with her sister Betsy, they nursed them until the time of their passing. The two sisters also worked among the young people in the city, hosting Bible studies, and Corrie initiated a club for the mentally handicapped. She loved them dearly. She wrote a book called Common Sense Not Needed, just a little pamphlet book about her work among those who weren't intellectually as able as others. And she taught them from the Bible. Tragedy struck the home in 1918, when their mother suffered a cerebral hemorrhage. While she remained bedridden, Betsy took on the housework and Cory took her place as a helper in the watch shop. The family soon discovered that Cory had a keen business sense, and due in large part to her management skills, the family started doing better financially. She became Holland's first licensed woman watchmaker. She went to Switzerland and did a a course in watchmaking and watch repair under the Swiss, who were of course the leaders, and came back and uh, became the main helper to Father Timbal in his watch shop. Their happy business and community life was disrupted when Corey's mother passed away in 1921. Though the laws greatly affected them, their faith in God's word provided comfort and confidence of a heavenly reunion. Corey's mother had been a great example of helping the less fortunate. And so, with a large and nearly empty house, they decided to do more for those in need. The family was very missions-minded and they were in touch with a lot of missionaries in Indonesia, which was a Dutch possession in the days when that happened. Not now, of course, but a very strong connection with Indonesia. And missionaries went over there and they received into the house the children of the missionaries uh, and brought them up, as it were, and kept them in their house, sent them to school, fed them, washed their clothes, helped them to learn about life. And they were separated by, from their parents for years. But there was always room in the Bayet. Years went by, and though war was looming in Europe, it was but a shadow in the Netherlands, until the unimaginable happened, and Germany invaded our country on the 10th of May, 1940. Within weeks, life changed drastically for everyone in Holland. They had believed that the Germans were going to give them immunity, as they had in the First World War, the German government took over and put its rules in place. The Nazis confiscated all radios in the Netherlands. They did not want anybody to have information about the war. But the Ten Booms managed to keep one and they kept it hidden inside the many stairs of their house. Now during the night, they would gather around the radio listening to the news that came in from London. But they would also listen to the speeches of our Queen because At the beginning of the war, our royal family had to find refuge in London. And listening to the voice of our queen would give people great hope and courage. They also could listen to the speeches of Hitler. I heard her say a couple of times, it started out in a normal voice. And then the voice got more and more excited and higher and higher, and in the end it was the voice of a demon. Unable to sleep one night due to the sound of enemy planes and explosions, Corey went into the kitchen to find Betsy calming her own nurse with tea. As the sound of the planes diminished, Corey returned to her darkened room. Feeling her way to the bed, she cut her hand on a sharp object. It was shrapnel from the explosions. If I hadn't gone to the kitchen, surely I would have been killed. Corey later told Betsy. There are no ifs with God, her sister replied. Being in the center of his will is our only safety. Corey often sought comfort in that reply, especially when the Nazis took further steps to consolidate their power. 
At, at first, the persecution of the Jewish people wasn't, uh, it wasn't noticed very much. But in, as time went on, they saw that their Jewish friends were being picked out. Initially forced to wear an identifying Star of David, Jews and their shops were soon attacked, their houses raided, and eventually they were rounded up. The Nazis also turned their attention on the Dutch men. At one occasion, a Jewish neighbor's shop was being attacked, but Father Ten Boom and Corey pulled him in the safety of their own home. They contacted Corey's brother, Willem, who, along with his son, Kik, had begun finding hiding places for Jews. Now, weeks later, when Corey ran into Kik, she asked about her neighbor. You must stop asking so many questions if you wish to continue being part of the Dutch underground resistance, her nephew replied. The statement shocked Corey and left her, Casper and Betsy facing a dilemma. Their Christian faith motivated them to help people, but the idea of being part of the resistance seemed political. A turning point came when a man showed up at the Bayet with an orphan Jewish baby. A local pastor, unwilling to take any personal risk, had refused to take care for the child. Appalled, Father Temboom didn't hesitate to take the little one. And Betsy and Corey rallied around Father's decision. They would risk their lives in order to save others. This is where Corey's previous experience organizing youth groups became quite beneficial. After some time, I had 30 teenager boys, 20 teenager girls, 20 men and 10 women. And once we heard that in a Jewish orphanage in Amsterdam, all the babies had to be killed because they were Jewish babies. When we heard that, our boys said, we will save them and we will steal them. And they went to that orphanage and they stole all the hundred babies. <laughs> you will say, how is it possible? I will tell you a secret. You know, sometimes there came to us good uh, Germans and who were uh, soldiers who were in the army. And they said, we don't like to work any longer for Adolf Hitler. We will not kill the Jewish people. Can you help us? And I always said, sure, I will help you. Just come in. And we gave them, of course, a civil clothing, and we took the uniforms. So they found themselves, of course, in a very different situation. Um, and they took a lot of risks, really. Everybody was welcome at their house, Jewish or not. Father Tembom said quite distinctly that I will take in anybody who comes to my house, whether Jewish or not, but they did have a special love and interest in the Jewish people. It didn't take long for Jews to show up at the door desperately looking for shelter and refuge. Mothers with children, young people, the elderly, each facing the threat of incarceration because they were Jews. No one was turned away. They tried to keep it as quiet as possible. But the time came when there was too much activity going on. The Tenbohms lived in the center of, of Harlem. It was very near the police station, which makes one think that there had to be policemen there who were mainly loyal to the Queen still. Or else it couldn't possibly have gone on so long. But they began to suspect that their activities were known. They had to have extra ration cards and the, the ration cards weren't easy to come by. The government was supplying them with food for three people. And of course, there are a lot many, there are a lot more people in the house than that. Fred Korenstra used to read the Ten Boom's electric meter and had been given a position with the food office. Unsure of Fred's loyalty, Corey boldly asked for the impossible, 100 ration cards. To her relief, Fred agreed, but there was a problem. He had to account for each card to a Nazi supervisor. To his credit, he faked a robbery, asking a friend to beat him up in order to make his alibi seem more convincing. Months passed, and the Ten Boom's hidden guests were moved to other locations in secret. 
Fearing their telephone was tapped, a secret code was devised. Ik heb een horloge die gemaakt moet worden. That's how it sounded in Dutch. In English, I have a watch that needs repair, a caller would say. That meant another person that needed a hiding place would be arriving. The Tambooms used this sign to let the people of the resistance know that it was safe in the house, safe to come in. And this meant stay away. In order to keep the housebound guests occupied, the Tambooms created work schedules and activities. So often it was just like one big family together, you know, not thinking of being, you must have been living sort of in the balance of the real life they were actually living, where they had enough to eat and were looking after each other and loved each other, and the knowledge that uh, one day the Nazis might come. Things continued to get even more difficult. Several times, Corey's nephews and even her sister Nolly were arrested, imprisoned and released. The possibility of a raid on the Baye was very real. They were in touch with several people who thought that this had to happen. They had to have a hiding place. It was too dangerous for them and for their visitors. It was decided that a hiding place needed to be built. The room furthest from the doors to the street was chosen. It was Corey's bedroom, which was at the very top of the stairs. In case of a raid, the Nazis would probably search every room and it would take them longer to get to the upstairs. This is Corey's bedroom. This is where her bed was. And this is actually the shelter or the hiding place. Now you see this wall here is built into the ceiling and built into the floor. The Nazis would always do these raids and they would come into the houses and, and, and uh, hit the walls to listen if there was a hollow space behind it. So that's why they built the floor of the, the wall in the floor and in the ceiling. And so if you bang it, it sounds very solid. This is the closet with the bed linen and uh, you see here the entrance. So it could be opened, people could go in here and Corey always put a uh, suitcase in front of this opening. Here they would remain for approximately 48 hours. Sometimes they were here with six people with only a small opening for air. Once the Jews were in the house, they couldn't go outside. It was way too um, dangerous. So the Tambooms put here some straw mats. Now as long as they stayed down like this, they could get fresh air and sunshine. To warn the occupants, buzzers were installed at several places in the house. When the hiding place was built and the buzzers were installed, they began practice runs. Now imagine them sitting at the table. Corey would quietly get up, go to the buzzer, press it. Suddenly everyone scrambled. Plates were picked up and the table set to make it look like only three people were eating. The others rushed up the stairs, grabbing their belongings with them at the same time. There could be nothing to show that others were living there. If someone had been sleeping, they would have to turn the mattress over so there would be no warm spot on the bed. Nothing could give them away. It would be a matter of life and death and they had to be inside the hidden room all within one minute. Eventually the drills would pay off. Cory had been battling influenza for several days when there was a knock on the door. Once there came a man to me and said, will you save my wife? She is arrested. She has saved Jewish people and now she is in a police station and there is one policeman who will run the risk to set her free if we pay him 600 guilders, but I have no money. That man was a betrayer. The man's name was John Vogel, Jan Vogel in Dutch. He pleaded with Corey to help him with some money to get his wife out of prison. Ik weet dat je hier mensen helpt. In English, I know you help people here, he said. Having helped him, Corrie retired to her room. There were lots of people in the house. Willem was there, the brother. 
He held a Bible study. Now, can you imagine doing all this kind of thing, knowing they were in danger? <laughs> they just sort of didn't believe it, that it was going to happen. Willem was there. I'm not, not sure if his wife, Tina, was there with him. She probably was. And whoever was coming to that particular Bible study. Then there were the Jewish people, and there was another man who'd come into the house on... Um, we don't really know why. We don't exactly know who that was. And then there was the young man, Hans Pollet, who had just arrived on his bike, had parked his bike outside and taken the ration cards into the house. Still feeling sick, Corey slept upstairs. At five o'clock, the doorbell sounded. Betsy opened the door, only to be pushed back by the Nazis. Thankfully, there was a buzzer near the door and she had been able to press it. Corey was awakened when the guest burst into her room, into the hiding place. The unusual layout of the Baye slowed down the Nazis, a detail that Corey would later attribute to God's providence. By the time they got to her room, Corey was sitting here alone. Accusing her of being the ringleader of the Baye, the Nazis demanded that she would tell where the Jews were hiding. Corey played dumb, and they slapped her. Taken into a waiting truck, Corey was horrified to see Betsy and a nephew bruised and bleeding. A Nazi officer offered Father Tambom to remain at home if he promised not to cause any more trouble, but Father Tambom refused. Thrown into a truck, the ten booms were taken away. Corey eventually found out that they had been turned in by the same man that she helped, John Fogel. They were taken from the police station to the prison in Scheveningen on the Dutch coast. And it was there that Father and Betsy and Corey, at least Betsy and Corey, saw their father for the last time. They were lined up with their noses to the wall, and Father Timbom quoted Psalm 91:1, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And they didn't see him again. Betsy and Corey were examined by the medical people there and they determined that Corrie had pleurisy, that she was probably a danger to other women if she was put in the cells with other women. So she was separated from Betsy for the first time in her life, uh, put in a solitary confinement. No doubt, being in solitary confinement and with no knowledge about the well-being of her family and the Jewish guests was very trying for Corrie. Weeks later, around her 52nd birthday, Corey received a letter. It was from her sister, Nolly. My dear Corey, will you prepare yourself for this? Our dear father passed away 10 days after imprisonment. And of course, there was deep grief there, there must have been. And how she would have longed to be with Betsy, her companion and much loved sister. She didn't know that he where his body was, it was in fact thrown into an unmarked grave. All she knew was that he had died, but was happy for him because she knew the best was yet to be. He'd always, always told them that. He'd always said, our times are in God's hands. While the letter bore difficult news, it also bore news of great hope. Corey noticed that the handwritten address on the envelope seemed to be slanting towards the stamp. Carefully, she unglued it peeled it off and used the code, code word for the Jewish people and it said in Dutch, uh, all, all the watches are safe, meaning all the Jewish people get out of the hiding place. So that's all she knew at that point. Interrogated repeatedly, Corey gave witness to her faith, eventually bringing her Dutch interrogator close to a conversion. When I was in prison, I once was brought before my judge, and my life was in the hands of that man. And when we testified to our faith, the Lord touched the heart of that judge, and instead of an enemy, he became a friend. But he had to do his job. And so it happened that suddenly he showed me papers found in my house, and to my horror, I saw names, addresses, in particular, that could mean not only my death sentence, but the death sentence of my family and friends who were in prison. 
the judge said, can you explain these papers? I said, no, I can't. And I felt terrible, terrible unhappy. But he knew better than I how dangerous the papers were. And he turned, he opened the door of the stove and threw all the papers into the flames. My, how happy I was that moment. <laughs> if you had told me that I could be 100% happy when I was in a prison in the hands of an enemy, I should never have under- believed that. But when I saw these flames destroy these horrible papers, it was as if for the first time I understood Colossians 2.14 where it's written that Jesus has taken the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, has taken them out of the way and nailed them at the cross. A form of relief came from a rare show of kindness, as a nurse provided Corey with a small, easy-to-conceal Bible. It brought great comfort to Corey, and she read from it as often as she could in the darkness of her cell. After spending nearly three months in solitary confinement, Corey, along with other prisoners, was taken to a waiting train. And there, to her great delight and relief, she caught a glimpse of Betsy, her sister, who was helping other prisoners board a train. Corey pushed her way through the other prisoners, calling out her sister's name. Finally, the two sisters were reunited. It was such a blessing. But as the doors of the train closed, they had no clue where they were going. Was it 88 or something into one cattle truck? The walls of it, not much air coming in at all. Not really sure where they were going, except it was, they knew it was Germany bound. It was moving very slowly. Very little water was given. The people nearest the jug of water uh, got it all, of course, and the people who weren't near it didn't. Days later, the train finally came to a stop. Furcht was a, a on the premises somehow of the Philips factory, you know, the Dutch. They, they were making radios, I think, for a German aircraft. And they were used to that kind of work. They knew how to work on watches, so they did that work there. Betsy couldn't keep up as much, but they would have a, one day off a week and they would hold services. They would, at the weekend, they would have a praise service and they'd sing together. I think it was better than prison. They were together, so they had a lot of strength together in the communion with God and their knowledge of each other and their love for each other. They were, they were outgoing, they were able to help people. But terrible things went on, like one day the Germans lined the men up and shot them, not in their sight, but not within their range of vision, behind a wall. But they knew that the wives, you know, their weeping wives, they were losing their men. And then came D-Day, the 6th of June, when the Germans apparently had received knowledge that there was going to be movement of troops and decided to empty their concentration camp in the Netherlands. And then they moved on to the real horror. Ravensbrück, the notorious extermination camp for women, located in northern Germany. It was also a training center for female SS guards who were infamously inhumane and cruel. Along with other prisoners, Corrie and Betsy were made to strip naked and walk in front of Nazis and their guards for inspection. The first time was the worst. I've never felt so humbled, so, so miserable, so cold. And when I stood there and Betsy, my sister, stood beside me, I said, Betsy, I cannot bear this. This is so terrible. And I thought that I could break under the burden of that suffering. And then suddenly it was as if I saw Jesus at the cross. And the Bible says, they took his garment. He hanged there naked. And by my own suffering, I understood only a fraction of the suffering of Jesus. This is Camp Amersfoort one of the many camps set up in the Netherlands by the Nazis during the Second World War. And although this place is not as notorious as Auschwitz or Ravensbrück, it is representative of the horror that many prisoners suffered. There was absolutely no kindness shown them. Corrie often talked about the guards having had lessons in how to be cruel. 
the camp commander was a 28-year-old woman who'd had extra, extra lessons in how to be cruel. So they, they contrived to make life as difficult as possible. You know, people were given a number, didn't, they weren't referred to by their names. When Corey and Betsy arrived at Ravensbrück, every prisoner was being thoroughly searched. Corey worried that her little Bible would be discovered, so she hid it in the back of her dress. And then she started praying. She prayed, Lord, you caused the blind to see. Please make those that see blind. And when it was her turn to be searched, the guards somehow got distracted with another prisoner, and she walked right through. They were thrown into barracks 28 which was filled with twice as many women as it was built for. But they were together and they found a, the women had to share mattresses, dirty straw mattresses. There were fleas and lice, it was very dark. And when it was learnt that the guards didn't come into their particular barracks 28 and they wondered about it, they discovered that it was known to have so many fleas that the guards just put the food down inside the door and left them to it. Now, when I came in that prison, we had to live with 700 prisoners in a room that was built for 200. It was terrible dirty, and very soon our clothing were full of lice. Those lies have caused many sicknesses, but in some way they have helped us. For the guards would never come into our room. They were afraid to get lies from us. That was good. Since the guards avoided the barracks, Corey and Betsy took the opportunity to read the Bible with the ever-increasing number of desperate prisoners. When I was surrounded by people who had had a training in cruelties, and the Bible was forbidden. But we had every day twice a Bible uh, message in that room where we were together in the concentration camps with 700 prisoners. She must have seen specific cruelties. And of course, she learned that um, there was a crematorium. It was, it was obvious, it was seen and that she didn't know whether she'd be the next person to go into it. Pe women were taken away very often, uh, being told they were going to have a shower, so they got all happy. Uh, but when they got there, water didn't come out of the shower, but gas. So that got around. So when the people came in to say, give out the names of the people, you're going to have a shower, they didn't know it might be a shower, but possibly it would end in the crematorium. The cruelty on any level that the guards could do, they did it, including uh, the beating of Betsy. Betsy's health was declining, and because she was unable to work as fast as the guards demanded, she was beaten savagely. While all this hardship tested Corey's faith, it seemed to help Betsy's faith soar. To Corey's consternation, Betsy pitied the Nazis, even the traitor back home, uh, whose action caused the family to suffer so much misery. As their situation got worse, Betsy began experiencing visions of a brighter future. Yes, it was as if the Lord laid out for them the coming plans that they were going to do together. The first was that either in a dream or a vision, she was so weak, she was dying, but Betsy said, the Lord has told me that we are going to have a house in the Netherlands and it's beautiful, Cory, I've seen it. The Lord showed it to me, it was a very big house. And she said, Cory, God's shown me what we're going to do. We're going to have a, have a real home there for people who've suffered a lot psychologically in the war. We'll take them in, we'll look after them and we'll have, we'll have a garden for them. They can plant flowers, it will be so good for them. While Betsy's faith remained strong, her body was quickly wearing down. She slowly starved to death. They had to go to roll call every morning. And there came a time when Betsy couldn't walk. So they, the woman went on either side of her and carried her out, but the day came when she couldn't do that. Later that day, she was transferred to the infirmary. 
Weak though she was, Betsy shared with Corey an assurance that she had received from God, that before the year was over, they would be released. Now, Corey clung to this promise with all her heart, only to have it break when a few days later, she faced one of her greatest fears. She was told that her sister had died. Betsy was placed along with other corpses in a rundown latrine awaiting a mass burial. She had the most wonderful expression of peace and joy on her face and all the lines had fallen away. She was like she was when she was young. And Cora was, of course, delighted to see that, although she was devastated by her loss. She thought we'd always be together. That's what Betsy said. We'll always be together, Corey, you and me. Corey wondered if Betsy's last words regarding their release was a result of delirium. She was standing at roll call one morning when her number was called. Her prisoner number was called out with the prisoners who were told to step forward. She didn't know when her number was called what it meant. It could have meant the gas chambers. Sometimes people were supposedly set free. She didn't know if it was that. Slowly, she stepped out from the ranks and in case she was not to return, she handed her precious Bible to a prisoner. Obediently, she followed the guard, but not to the work fields or the trucks or the gas chamber. Corey was in fact taken into a room. To her surprise and without any explanation, Corey was given a pair of undersized shoes, an old dress, a hat, a coat, and her release papers. Soon she was walking past the armed guards with their vicious attack dogs, past the electrified gates, onto the camp gates. Betsy's words came to her mind. We will be released before the year is over. Years later, Corey would find out just how miraculous her release was. She only made one visit back to the concentration camp Ravensbrück. And she learned there, I don't know if she saw the record, she probably did, of the Ravensbrück prisoners. And she saw that all the women of her age were killed the next week. She called it a clerical error of man and a miracle of God. As in every concentration camp, the prisoners never knew whether they would live or die. It was the very same case with Betsy and Corey. This is the very road many prisoners walked down on their way to their execution. And this monument was built to honor their memory. With little money, Corey wandered through the city for days until a nurse took pity on her and helped her with a bath and food. Eventually, she made her way back over to Holland, to her beloved home, now a lonely place. She saw some of her family for the first time since her arrest. Her brother Willem had been imprisoned, contracted a disease and passed away as a result. Kick, his son, was never heard from again. Instead of feeling sorry for her circumstances, Corey reached out to those around her who had also suffered. She sought out the mentally handicapped children she had helped before the war and brought some of them to the Baye to live with her. Though she kept busy ministering to victims, Betsy's concern for the perpetrators would come to mind. Corey had never forgotten the traitor responsible for the misery of so many people. She harbored great bitterness against him. Corey knew, though, that uh, when the time came that she was released from the camp and was back home, that she had to write him a letter. And she did and said that he was forgiven. And then she explained the gospel very clearly. And after a war, that man was sentenced to death because he had caused the death of many Dutch people. And when I heard that, I wrote him, your betrayal has meant 
The death of my old father was 84 years old when they brought him into prison. After 10 days he died. My sister, who died after 10 months, terrible suffering. My brother, he came out alive with a sick man and died through that sickness and his son never came back. I myself have suffered terribly through in three different prisons. But I have forgiven you. And that is because Jesus is in my heart. And I send that man a New Testament and underlined the way of salvation. And that man wrote me that you could forgive me is such a great miracle that I have said, Jesus, when you give such a love in the heart of your followers, there's hope for me. Much of what Betsy had told Corey had come to pass. But there was more that Betsy had shared with her. We must also go to Germany. Germany has suffered so much. How did she know? No news was reaching her. No news came into them at all. No news went out from them all those months. They've, their houses are in ruins. They've, they haven't got power. How did she know that? It must have been a kind of vision or a very strong dream. But they won't need concentration camps after the war, Corrie. They won't need them at all. And we'll find one and we'll clean it and we'll paint it. And the outside it'll be lovely green like flowers coming up in the spring. And we'll look after them and we'll stay with them. Corrie said, will this be after, will we do have the house first or will this be the first thing we do? Will we go to Germany? Oh no, we'll have the house first. And then we'll be in the, in the new concentration camp, which will be turned into a nice home. And the house was indeed provided in Holland. There, to the consternation of the local people, Corrie took in the ostracized Dutch that had collaborated with the enemy. She did her best to rehabilitate them, to help them to face their mistakes and to be reintegrated into society. The house itself was exactly as Betsy had described it to Corrie as she was dying. Once the house was established, Corrie directed her work towards the second part of Betsy's vision, Germany. After some time, the German authorities came to her and they said, Fraulein, we've heard about your work and what you've done to help the homeless. And we want to tell you that we've got a building that, we might, that you might think suitable. It's a concentration camp in Darmstadt. And so she remembered uh, her sister's vision or dream of, of having a concentration camp and turning it into something that was light and clean and had lots of flowers. So she traveled there and she became convinced that this was what the Lord had in mind through Betsy's words when they were still far from being free. There were German people living there uh, lots of families and people all jumbled up together and their little r living spaces were separated by curtains um, that they were not private places at all and so she didn't go to a hotel or somewhere she stayed with them and could hear all the clattering and the talking going on and ministered with them for a long time so all three parts of Betsy's vision were fulfilled the home in the Netherlands where people were looked after for a long time and changed later when its initial purpose was no longer needed, changed into a kind of nursing home. And the vision in the Germany, the concentration camp, was completely fulfilled. And so was the going around the world. We must tell them, Corrie, what we've learned in this terrible place, that the love of God is stronger than the deepest darkness. And although she didn't go personally, her story did. Corey simply did what she felt God was telling her to do and people began to take notice. She took any opportunity to tell her story, not for any self-promotion, but because it resonated with so many who had experienced hardship due to the horrors of the war. Corey was speaking in a church in Germany at the end of the 40s and she was in front of a group of people who'd gathered there and at the back of the group she saw a man who wouldn't look into her eyes and suddenly and with a bit of a shock she recognized him as a guard 
from Ravensbrück who had been particularly cruel to her sister Betsy. Now when it was his turn to greet her, he said, Fraulein, I saw in the newspaper that you were coming. I was a guard at Ravensbrück and I don't know if you would remember me. But since the end of the war, a miracle happened in my life. I became a Christian and I've asked God to give me the opportunity to ask forgiveness from one of my former victims. And with that, he held out his hand and said, Fraulein, ma'am, will you forgive me? So what happened next must have happened in seconds. But Corrie stood there looking at him and she knew she couldn't do it. She couldn't stretch out her hand. All she could think of was Betsy's suffering. But then she did what was the secret of her victory in Christ. And she made a quick turning to him, not literally, she didn't move her head or anything, but she turned to the Lord and said, Lord, help. And on that prayer, she received a verse into her heart and mind from Romans 5. The love of God is brought into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who's given to us. And with that came a revelation that she was not expected to conjure out of her own heart and mind love for the man, but she could receive through the Holy Spirit that which was needed to forgive him. There was hatred and bitterness in my heart. I remembered how my dying sister had suffered through the cruelties of that man. But I know from the Bible that hatred means murder in God's eyes. And I said, oh, Father, forgive me in Jesus' name, my hatred. And the Lord took it away. And I said, thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have brought into my heart God's love through the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father, that your love in me is victorious over my hatred. And that moment my hatred disappeared. And I said, brother, give me your hand. I have forgiven you all. She regarded it as a very important part of her message. She asked me if I would help her to have two things in her messages. First and central was the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for the sins of the whole world. And she said, Corrie ten Boom must be behind the cross. And then I said, what's the second thing? And she said, forgiveness. And she told me the story of the guard. She let me into her world in a way that was disarming and caused a great sense of responsibility in being her co-worker. And she never spoke anywhere without those two elements being central. Her work eventually took her to the United States. She was virtually penniless, living frugally and making ends meet through the love offerings taken up for her at churches. She would go into a church and ask if she could share her story. Little by little, people began to take notice and her speaking engagements began to multiply. The time came when someone suggested a book. One of her fellow Dutchmen, a man called Brother Andrew, God Smuggler, had a book written with the help of the American narrative writers, John and Elizabeth Sherrill. And while they were working with him on that, he often mentioned his friend, Corrie ten Boom. At one point, Ruth, the wife of evangelist Billy Graham, had the idea to produce a movie based on the book. Soon production began. The movie was partly filmed in Harlem. Good morning. Mr. Boom? Yeah? My name's Vogel, young Vogel. <laughs> Ten Boom. Ten Boom. everyone. Come on, hurry. The film brought greater demands on Corey's time, and she received invitations to tell her story around the globe. To Corey, every open door was an opportunity to tell others more about her faith. It was just as Betsy had predicted. And she said, Anne, Corey, God's told me that we're going to go around the world together, and we're going to tell anyone who will listen what we have learned in this terrible place, that God's love is stronger than the deepest darkness, that Jesus is victor, that there is no pit so deep, the love of God is not deeper still, and they will believe us because we were here. 
She did have openings to speak in the States just about everywhere. And since she was approaching her mid-80s, she wasn't doing the world travels anymore. I think she, she in a sense, would like to have. But her heart was getting slower. Uh, but she had enormous opportunities through that movie. I joined her in 76, which was a year after the movie came out. I had prayed as a young woman of 21 that whatever it cost, I wanted to do the will of God. And I knew when I prayed, although it was with the deep joy of surrender and the presence of God, it was with many tears, because I knew there was a price to be paid. And there was. But I'm glad I paid it, because the Lord has been very real. He's kept all his promises. And perhaps being Corrie's servant was one of the most difficult, actually. I'm not very good at being a servant. And, but we, we were happy together. We were, a good co we were a good team. And it wasn't always perfect. It wasn't. And she wasn't perfect either, and she would have been the first to say so. But she came very quickly to the Lord and asked forgiveness as soon as she was aware of any sin. And she taught me to do that too, and then to ask, Lord, fill me afresh with your Holy Spirit. And she went on, you know, not, not bogged down by the sin. Cori was tireless at her work, encouraging others in their hardships, constantly retelling the story, sharing the lessons she had learned, and recounting the many ways in which God had been faithful to help her. She rejoiced to do God's will, never flinching from her responsibility, never saying no, until the day came when her body began to wear out. On that particular morning, it was a a couple of years later, and she was in a rented house in uh, Placentia in Orange County, California. She'd been tired. Uh, I went to her room a bit later because I didn't see any light in the room. I thought she must be getting some extra sleep, which was good, I thought. And I felt my way into the room. I knew the room very well. It had dark curtains which shut out the light on the window facing east and I put the tray down and I pulled the dark heavy curtain and it flung back and then there was a flimsy green curtain and I that swung back very very quickly and I, I turned around to face her and I sort of froze in my tracks because it was a very different Tonda Corrie from the one I'd said goodnight to the night before. She looked really distressed, and when I said anything, she didn't respond. And my first silly response was, well, have I done something wrong? But of course, that wasn't it. That wasn't the kind of person she was. There must be something very wrong. I ran to her, took hold of her hand. It was very flaccid, it was cold, it didn't respond to mine. And I said, let's pray to Under Corrie, because that's what we always did. We always went to the Lord. And then instead of this uplifted hand gesture, which was common to her prayers with open eyes, she looked down and clasped her hands together. I ran to the phone and an ambulance came. And later that day, it was announced that she'd had a very severe stroke. We didn't know how severe. She was two weeks in the hospital. She was able to go home after two weeks because she was able to walk. But she never regained speech and other things that we do with the language. She couldn't read or write or you know, point at the right thing and it mean the same thing to her as it meant to me. She was a completely different person. If ever there was a different person, whenever she had to adapt to something, that must have been the biggest one. It was like an imprisonment, not with cruelty. It was a kind of precious imprisonment as through the next nearly five years she went through it with the Lord. And her voice couldn't say it to me, but her life did, that I've served him in my youth and I'll serve him in my old age. I served him in my strength and I'll serve him in my weakness and in my death is in my life. And underlying the whole of Corrie ten Boom's life was the verse in Psalm 31, verse 15, my times are in your hand. That was taught in the BA. It was the theology of the Dutch Reformed Church. It was the very healthy form of Calvinism, which sees the, the compassion and goodness and love of God 
and the happening of things in the light of that. That whatever happens, somehow it's allowed by God. As Betsy sing those words, as it were in the Ravensbrook, somewhere on the story of our life, the blueprint, God had written the word Ravensbrook. So believing that when things go wrong, I'm very much like things to work out exactly as I've arranged them. When they don't, after all these years, I'm learning to be a bit more flexible. <laughs> That's the sovereignty of God. Corey loved an object lesson that she often used in her public speaking. She would show an embroidery from the wrong side. It would be a mangled mess of threads, hardly much to look at, and a confusing mess. Then she would flip the same cloth over, and on the other side would be a beautiful crown. It was a vivid example of the lessons Corey had learned. In her darkest days, she could make little sense of her serious predicament. But in the end, it was God's way of weaving into her being a crown of life. Things were in fact very clear to God. She treasured what she had learned during the war for the rest of her life. When the ability to speak was taken from her in her old age, she stayed faithful to her faithful God. Like the poem she quoted so often. My life is like a weaving between my God and me. I do not choose the colors. He worketh steadily, oft times he weaveth sorrow, and I in foolish pride forget he sees the upper, and I the underside. Not till the loom is silent and the shuttle cease to fly will God unroll the canvas and explain the reason why. The dark threads are as needful in the skillful weaver's hand as the threads of gold and silver in the pattern he has planned. Pray for yourself and for the other Christians. When there's no vision, the people perish. And we all know that we live in a time now that there is a great darkness and fog over the whole world. And the great joy is when we have the word of God, we can see the things as it were from God's point of view. Look around and be distressed. Look within and be depressed. Look at Jesus and be at rest.